Now I'd like to thank our keynote speaker. I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, Jamie Rizzo. Um, Dr. Rizzo is from Pace University in Manhattan, and she's a native of Hawaii. She came here and came to Queensborough Community College, just like Dr. Savano said. She um, got her AA degree here and then went on to Queens College, and then she was a presenter at a URS back when she was an undergraduate. After that, she got her PhD from Queens, Queens College um, under the guidance of Professor Robert Engel. And uh, she started at Pace University in 2001. In four short years, she received tenure and became an associate professor. And this year, she became a full <coughs> professor. Um, She is the author of many publications and holds numerous patents. Um, and she's been involved in mentoring undergraduates since her time as a graduate student at Queens College. So, Jamie Rizzo, uh, today she'll be speaking on antimicrobial and antiviral surfaces. Uh, I'm so happy to be here today, I'm especially happy that we have such great weather, and I'm really happy that I'm not having a massive sneezing attack, but just in case I have my box of tissues, this allergies has been horrible. But um, as you've heard, I'm an alumna of Queensboro and of the City University of New York system, and uh, so to me, coming here today is like coming home. So in preparing my talk, I decided to look up the definition of home. So I went to uh, dictionary.com, and as a scientist, I decided to analyze the, the results. So the first three definitions, a house, apartment, or other shelter that is the usual residence of a person, family, or household. Uh, the place in which one's domestic affections are centered. Well, those first two definitions apply to my home in Long Island, not to Queensboro. So I still, I still kept searching. Uh, number three, a person's native place or own country. That definition applies to my uh, native island of Oahu. So I kept on uh, my quest for the true search of the definition of home for Queensboro. Then I came upon this definition, an institution for the homeless or sick. I said, I better keep looking. Uh, the dwelling place or retreat of an animal. I'm still not there yet. Because to me, Queensboro is the destination or goal. Queensboro is a place of refuge. I found yet another definition. Uh, a principal base of operations or activities. Well, that is uh, the definition of Pace University, where I currently am. So thank you again for having me here. And now I'd like to, oh, I forgot this. Home is where the heart is. So my heart is at Queensboro, at Queens College, um, Oahu, at Pace University. So now I'd like to talk about um, our latest work. Now for some time, our laboratory has been involved with the synthesis and investigations of polycationic salts. Now these salts have been used to generate um, our antimicrobial and antiviral surfaces. So I need to talk a little bit about the polycationic organic salts, and then we'll get into our use uh, on developing antimicrobial and antiviral surfaces. So we found over the years, and again, this work had started um, as I was an undergrad, continued on through graduate school, we found that there are quite a few applications for these polycationic organic salts. They include their use as antibacterials, as antihydrophobic agents. We found that they interact with DNA. Uh, they can modulate potassium ion channels. They can act as host guest binding agents. They can be converted to ionic liquids. And then uh, we can use these polycationic organic salts to generate antimicrobial and antiviral surfaces. Uh, and some of these salts can also be used to generate gelation materials. So there, um, our polycanonic organic salts can be separated into a few different categories. So the first category I'm going to talk about is what we call polycationic organic strings. So here's the synthesis of a simple uh, monocationic as well as a dicationic string. So if we treat, uh-oh, I don't think this laser works. Hang on. If we treat DABCO, that's that first 
um, structure on the left hand side, that's 1, 4 diazobicyclo, 2, 2, 2 octane. If we treat that with one equivalent of, a mini, uh, of an omega halo 1 alkanol in ethyl acetate, we can coordinate one of the ammonium sites to generate this species here, that's a monocationic salt. We can further elaborate by treating it with another equivalent. Uh, in acetonitrile, you need to heat this up, and that will give you your dicationic salt. Similarly, you can treat DABCO with an alkyl halide, primary, a primary alkyl halide in aqueous ethanol to give you um, another type of monocationic string. Now, that first mono string um, is going to become, you'll see this later on in the talk, is going to become significant for our work with host guest binding uh, interactions. It's a modification for the cyclodextrin, so keep that in mind, and then that. Uh, second structure down here, uh, that monocationic salt is significant for our antimicrobial and an, uh, basically the antimicrobial work and some of our uh, naturally derived anti, new antimicrobial surfaces. So you'll be seeing these structures uh, throughout the talk. We can also generate odd number of DABCO strings. So what do we have? Is that odd? Yes, thank goodness. There's five DABCO units there. And this can be done with uh, treating a previously prepared dicationic string with dinyl chloride in pyridine, you activate the primary hydroxyl groups, then you perform SN2 uh, using two equivalents of your previously prepared monocationic string, and then you can further elaborate. So that's a way to make um, an odd number polycationic salt. You can make an even number of polycationic uh, string by treating two equivalents of DABCO with an alpha omega uh, dihaloalkane in acetonitrile with heat. Now notice with this dicationic string, you have DABCO units at the termini. This species is going to come into play when we talk about um, the use of these materials as antiviral surfaces. And then you can further elaborate by treating it again with an omega halo 1 alkanol, two equivalents, and so on. So this work was uh, all done as I was an undergraduate in the laboratory of Bob Engel at Queens College. So one of the applications that I have mentioned uh, was their use as antibacterials. So we see then with this 10-10-4 uh, string, 10-10-4 string uh, means it's a tetracationic salt with 10 methylene groups between the two DABCO units and then 10 methylene groups outside of it. So that's a 10-10-4 string. And we tested, we, well, we looked at the effect of a particular string on the growth of E. coli. And we noticed that, oh, so here's a control in red. And we noticed that at a very low concentration, so that's that light blue color, 0.02 milligrams per mil, we see complete inhibition with that particular string. So now, not all the strings um, showed antibacterial activity. Um, it depends on the methylene groups in between the DABCO units, as well as the methylene groups outside of the DABCO units. Another application was their use as antihydrophobic agents. So here we see um, the solubility. What we're looking at is the solubility of parabromotoluene. So as we, ooh, who's that? As we, um, as we increase the concentration of a particular salt, in this case, look at the yellow, it's 224. Thank you. Uh, 224. So again, that's a tetracationic string with two methylene groups between the DABCO units and then two methylene groups outside of it. We see that the solubility of the uh, parabromotoluene significantly increases until it reaches a certain maximum, then it significantly decreases. Again, not all of the salts um, have this type of uh, effect. Again, it depends on the methylene groups used. Another uh, category of the salts are what we call polycationic organic rings. And we made a whole bunch of different ring systems. We have them based on um, the paracyclophanes. Uh, we have olefinic type rings, we have acetylenic type rings, we have biphenyl rings, and we have saturated rings. Some of these rings have shown antimicrobial, uh, antibacterial activity, um, and then some of these acetylenic rings showed interaction with double-stranded DNA. And here's just a, a chemical transformation to generate the, um, pot, one of the polycationic paracyclophane derivatives. Another application I mentioned was a host guest binding interaction. So what we did was uh, treat cyclodextrin. Some of you are familiar with cyclodextrin. It's primarily used as a host to a variety of different guests. So what we did was substitute uh, a cationic substituent at the primary hydroxyl groups. That's the R group shown there. 
this was done using a well-known procedure. So we take our cyclodextrin, we tosylate it in pyridine. So we've activated, uh, generating a very good leaving group at all primary hydroxyl sites. Uh, following that, we prepared a um, uh, SN2 reaction by treating the cyclodextrin with um, an appropriate amount of a mono, previously prepared monocationic string. Now notice we form a new carbon-nitrogen bond here. This work will, is one of the um, stepping stones into our ideas for, for generating antimicrobial surfaces. And you're going to see the same type of chemistry a little later on. So here is a proton and carbon spectra of this particular uh, modified cyclodextrin. And what we did was we looked at binding interactions. Could these uh, modified cyclodextrins bind to any, um, any significant type of anion, uh, anionic material? So we looked at whatever we actually had in the lab. And we actually stole some from Dr. Tropp's lab, uh, but don't tell him. So uh, we, we took some anionic forms of, of some biologically significant species, some amino acids, some tetrapeptides, uh, folic acid. We also looked at erythrum, uh, uh, phosphonomycin, which is also uh, an antibiotic. We looked at DAMP and DTMP, and we measured the binding constant. Um, and over, oh, we also looked at some alpha omega dicarboxy uh, dicarboxylic salts. And the overall trend, so when you look at this data, we found that 1B beta, 1B beta is a beta cyclodextrin, so that means it has seven um, glucose rings. Uh, so 1B beta is a beta cyclodextrin with a C8 a C8OH group that has been modified on that uh, primary hydroxyl group. So we found that the 1B beta modified cyclodextrin seems to provide the best overall binding with all of the guests that were examined. We also found that uh, phosphonomycin and the bases did not bind well at all. And the same trend again for 1B beta, uh, shown here for folic acid and, and the tetrapeptides and the amino acids. Oh, here's one of my favorites. OK, so another application was the um, conversion of some of our polycationic organic salts into ionic liquids. Um, and NAILS and LIPS, NAILS is an acronym for non-aqueous ionic liquids. And LIPS, actually, we can take credit for that. We developed that uh, acronym in Bob Engel's lab that, sa that stands for liquid ionic phosphates. So, you know, it was Dr. Dr. Ram Nareen's research. Uh, we actually worked together in the same laboratory as grad students. And her primary research to date, as many of you know, is the synthesis and investigation of these ionic liquids. Um, so we were quite thrilled to be able to come up with this nails and lips. In fact, I've been trying to think of a research project based on the acronym HAIR. So I've had a couple of ideas. I was thinking hydrophobic and ionic reagents. But you know, that way it was sort of flow. You have nails, lips, and hair. Uh, not many research uh, scientists try to develop research projects based on acronyms, but that's just me. OK, so non-aqueous ionic liquids. In fact, uh, it was in, again, Bob Engel's lab that we first saw a development of these um, ionic liquids. These are salts at room temperature. That are, uh, these are salts that at room temperature are liquid. Now, we know that salts at room temperature, regular type of salts at room temperature are solid. OK, so we saw this um, type of work in CNE News. And um, notice that they have, they're based on quaternary ammonium salts. Right? And so we said, hey, wait a second. We have tons of these salts coming out of our, out of our butts in the lab. You know, we've been making all sorts of quaternary ammonium strings, poly, uh, paracyclophanes, rings, cyclodextrins. So let's see if we use their procedure, if we can um, generate ionic liquids as well. And in fact, we were successful. It's a different type of um, anion that we've actually developed. Notice it's a phosphate and not, not a hexafluorophosphate. Um, so that's why we called it LIPS, liquid ionic phosphates. And when you listen to uh, Dr. Ram Nareen's students this afternoon, you'll hear all about the latest research on ionic liquids. Another application for these polycationic salts is that some of them have shown to modulate um, voltage-gated potassium ion channels. So what are ion channels? They're transmembrane proteins that catalyze the transport of ions. They mediate uh, electrical activity. They can regulate the heart rate, muscle contraction, neurotransmitter release, cell proliferation, and neuronal excitability. 
Uh, any type of aberrations in the activities of these channels can lead to cardiovascular disease, immune system disease, smooth muscle disorder, and cell proliferative uh, disorder. So we found in a collaborative effort um, this is work that's been done uh, with Wild Cornell, Jeff Abbott at Wild Cornell. We found that some of our um, uh, polycationic organic salts can specifically act as either potassium ion channel blockers as well as um, openers. So here we're showing uh, three representative um, species. We have a DABCO, what we call DABCO C16 because it has 16 uh, carbon atoms, DABCO C12 as well, and we call this a parazyla didabco. These three specifically act as potassium ion channel blockers. We have a European patent uh, for this uh, method. Uh, the US is pending. And then some of the channel openers include uh, didabco string, so you have methylene groups, whether it's saturated or unsaturated, or ring species, and then they terminate with uh, dabco units. Some of those, as well as our aromatic didabcos, omega hydroxyl, so they have to terminate, some of those that terminate with hydroxyl groups, also specifically act as a channel opener. These molecules will increase potassium currents and they decrease cellular excitability in other tissues and cells. Okay, so another application for these uh, polycationic organic salts include their use as generating antimicrobial surfaces. So I would say for the past uh, six years, ever since I started at PACE, my, the major part of my research has been directed towards this, antimicrobial surfaces. So we asked ourselves, can we apply carbohydrate chemistry to generate surfaces bearing organizations of detergent-like adjuncts as antimicrobial agents? It's early in the morning, maybe people are like, I don't even understand that sentence. But let me break it down for you um, in just a minute. What we did was we looked at a bunch of different carbohydrate-based surfaces. We looked at cotton, at wood, paper, cork, and bulk cellulose. Now here's the idea. Remember, this is one of the first uh, schematics that you saw. It's a generation of a monocationic string, right? Now we already knew that some of these strings had uh, antibacterial activity. So we said, well, what if we can uh, covalently bind on these monocationic strings that bear antibacterial activity onto a given surface? Would that surface then be rendered antimicrobial? And fortunately, that's why I guess I was promoted and have tenure, the answer was yes. Okay, so we took this same procedure, right, that we saw before with the, um, the cyclodextrin work, right? This is a carbohydrate-based surface. We tosylated with um, uh, pyridine. In fact, we've been able to modify the procedure so we can do this under milder conditions. We can use uh, aqueous sodium bicarb instead of pyridine, so it's environmentally more friendly um, and industrially much more friendly. Then what we do is attach these monocationic salts onto the activated surface. So now you've formed a new covalent bond. It's a new carbon nitrogen bond. So you have that antimicrobial agent covalently bond onto a given surface, like if I was wearing cotton, it would be like taking my cotton jacket, um, stirring it up in a solution of tosyl chloride in uh, aqueous um, sodium bicarb, washing it with a water wash, you let it stir for maybe an hour, you wash it uh, with simple water, then you react it with your a solution of your monocationic string and, you for, and then you wash it again with a uh, great water wash, thorough water wash, and then you form that new carbon-nitrogen bond. <coughs> Sorry. So to date, we have been awarded two patents for this technology. We have five others uh, that are pending related to this type of technology. So we tested um, those modified surfaces against a a variety of gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria that are noted here, as well as fungi. Uh-oh, I feel a tickle in my throat. <coughs> so um, here's a representation of a tested cloth against a gram-positive bacteria. So if we look at uh, quadrant one, we see blank cloth blank. That's an unmodified cloth. That, that means it's a simple cloth, has not been treated using our technology, and uh, no bacteria has been added. We see uh, bacterial growth, and that comes from the normal handling of the cloth. In quadrant two, that says blank. That is a treated cloth with uh, no bacteria added. Now you can note that there is no uh, bacteria due to the regular handling of the cloth. 
Quadrant three, that's our most exciting quadrant, whether you recognize it or not. That is a modified cloth with the bacteria added, and we see absolutely no growth whatsoever. And then uh, quadrant four is the unmodified cloth with the bacteria, and of course you uh, would expect to have the full uh, growth of bacteria. So similarly with fungi, here we have Aspergillus, Niger. In the left, uh, the left side, we have the unmodified paper, and it's this blue colored paper that was a paper given to us by the uh, USDA as we have a collaboration with them. They're testing to see if their paper um, will uh, prevent fungi from growing. And in fact, it does. So here on the right side, <coughs> there is a modified paper with the aspergillus added and no growth whatsoever. Same thing for E. coli on the left, unmodified with added E. coli on the right, modified paper with added E. coli, no growth. Same thing for staph. Okay, so this is a schematic, of course, of a carbohydrate-based surface. And we found that all gram-positive and all gram-negative bacteria are killed using a C16 chain. That is, except for uh, Pseudomonas. If you want to kill Pseudomonas, um, you need to have a C12 chain. C12 kills Pseudomonas selectively. So if you want full kill of all gram-positive and gram-negative, including Pseudomonas, you want to make a hybrid, and that's what we've been able to, to demonstrate. Then we decided to look at other, um, uh, other type of surfaces, including, that could be possibly modified, including wool and silk. Wool, because it has approximately 11% serine residues. Serine, of course, it has its primary hydroxyl groups. Any surface that um, has a primary hydroxyl group, we can activate and then we can um, treat it with our monocationic agent and form a new covalent bond to it. And silk has about 20% serine residues. So we have demonstrated this as well. Um, my collaborator, my former mentor, now collaborator, Bob Engel, has this great idea to um, approach Victoria's Secret with his antibacterial and you know, antifungal um, silk. So we're leaving that to him to do. Uh, so here is representation of serine, and we tosylated again. We've modified the procedure so we can do this in aqueous sodium bicarb. You activate it and then treat it with um, an equivalent of the monocationic salt. We can also modify residual hydroxyls of polyethylene glycol, and we can modify bulk cellulose. So this, this is um, what well, we asked, using our carbohydrate chemistry, can we prepare antiviral surfaces based on bulk cellulose? My student will be talking about the antiviral results in her uh, presentation a little later this morning. But basically, it's the same type of chemistry, but using a different reagent. So notice it's a didabco, a dicationic string that's effective against the viruses. It's different than that for the antimicrobial, you know, the antibacterial and antifungal work. We also have an ongoing collaboration with NADIC, the U.S. Army. Uh, they were interested in testing our modified cloths against uh, anthrax spores. So this is their little setup, and they put our cloth in there, and they blow through uh, anthrax spores. And here's some of the results. We see the blank, and we see our modified uh, cotton. And that, we, that, was, that one was modified with a DABCO C16. And we see significant uh, anthrax spore inhibition. Uh, Army was also interested in um, us modifying their canvas material. And they use canvas materials to make their tents. And they spend millions and millions of dollars a year uh, making new tents for the military because of, uh, due to the degradation of these tents, standing outdoors, standing in the jungle, standing in the desert, the tensile strength decreases over time. And um, in addition to that, EPA has rendered copper eight quinoline um, hazardous to the environment. So the copper aquinoline is what the Army is presently using as their antimicrobial agent. So they need to find a new technology. That's why they're interested in us. Oh, that would be very nice. Um, so this is the methods and materials that the Army um, has for their protocol. Basically, they take our treated uh, canvas material and they make a little concoction of um, topsoil and cow poop and sand. They, equi they equilibrate it with water. They bury it underground. They remove it after a certain uh, week interval. They test it for tensile strength as well as their antimicrobial activity. 
Oh, and it's found, the most important finding, it's found that um, our technology stands up to the copper eight. So it's just as good. It's no better, but it's just as good as the copper eight. We've also been able to uh, modify um, naturally derived type surfaces. Those include agarose, carrageenan, chitosan, and gelatin B. And we can clearly see why. Here's the structure of agarose. So we see a primary hydroxyl group. We can easily activate it and then perform an SN2 using our previously prepared monocationic string. Same thing goes for carrageenan. There's your primary hydroxyl group. Uh, same thing applies for chitosan, and chitosan is uh, significant as it's used uh, quite frequently as wound dressings. So we also have collaboration with Johnson Johnson, which I'll talk to you a little later about, but it's, a lot of it was based on chitosan, modified chitosan. And gelatin B, now in gelatin B we see a secondary hydroxyl group, but fortunately we are able to hit the secondaries as well as the primary, so we've been able to modify gelatin B. Some of these um, naturally derived surfaces, though, are, are a little bit of a problem because you're getting these like goopy, it's not a nice thin film, which is what we're trying to develop, so we need to work on a new solvent system. Um, some of them are just like goopy or clumpy, so that's a an ongoing uh, project that we're working on. Uh, there are a number of potential applications for all of this technology, include their use as protective clothing, filters, um, sanitary materials, containers, linens, and work surfaces. Uh, antimicrobial, antimicrobial gelation materials. So that was another application for some of these uh, polycationic organic salts. So there's an aim in wound management. Uh, that is to control the condition of a wound, to encourage the healing process by keeping the area moist or to eliminate the formation of dry, crusty tissue, and also to prevent access uh, to the wound of microbes. Uh, so secreting skin wounds can be found if, uh, if you have any of these um, uh, open burns, open surgical wounds, and so on. And if you have those type of conditions, it can unfortunately lead to anemia, infections, shock, and even death. So the current methods um, in, wound, in the wound dressing field is to use gauze dressings, non-woven fabrics, cellulose, and synthetic products, enzyme additives, chemical agents to digest the organic secretions. Now it's been found, as I said with, my, with our collaboration with Johnson Johnson Wound Management Division, that some of our salts um, have been shown to um, act, ha have the capabilities to act as a, a gelation materials where they can be placed over a particular wound. Uh, and sp uh, specifically, we, we're talking about unsymmetrical type strings. So say it's a DABCO unit, you've seen them before, the dicationic, where you have um, 10 methylene groups out here and 10 methylene groups out there, but that would be symmetrical. An unsymmetrical string would be maybe you have three and six, okay? Some of those act um, as a gelation material. Others include short hydrocarbon chains bearing omega hydroxyl groups. So if you terminate some of these with hydroxyl groups, they can act as a gelation material. Also longer hydrocarbon chains bearing omega tosylate groups, those with tosylate groups hanging out at the end. These uh, particular uh, structures or, or types of compounds are water-soluble liquids and they gel at physiological pH. So to date we have um, three uh, pen patents that are pending with Johnson Johnson on this work. And believe it or not, I have not done all this work by myself. Uh, we have a bunch of collaborators that uh, we do this work with, and it's my, the first one listed is my former mentor, Bob Engel at Queens College, Jeff Abbott at Wild Cornell, Nigel Yarlett at Pace, Karen Malconian at LIU, she's our biologist who does all of the biological testing for our antimicrobial surfaces, um, Grasa Soros at University of Minho, he's testing out physical characteristics of our modified cloths. Uh, Patrick Charter, J&J, &J, BCTT, this is a private uh, fabric manufacturing company who we have a licensing agreement with. They develop or they manufacture the materials for the Army. And Double Sport Inc. is another company who we have a licensing agreement with. Uh, Double Sport is a, an athletic apparel um, company. So they're looking at particularly antifungal type clothing. And here's our research group. They do most of the work, well, sometimes. Around finals, they really don't do any work. But um, my research group, so we have Ali Hussein, Christina Rivera, who's here acting as a moderator, Gloria Wan, you'll, um, if you get a chance, you get to hear her talk about the antiviral surfaces, uh, Eric Nelson, 
We have some former and some present, some current research assistants in this picture. So we got Nancy as Kona. Nancy has graduated last year. She's now a um, New York City teaching fellow. James Nicotri. James is graduating. Oh boy, I'm missing graduation next Wednesday because of the marm. But um, James is graduating next Wednesday, and he will also uh, be a New York City teaching fellow. Susan Pun, um, Alvin Nagai. Alvin will be starting dental school at Stony Brook in the fall. Uh, Chris Chum, Chris Chum, um, Christy Macy, and Megan Shevlin. Former research students. Okay, so we have Ashi Stacker, Josh Harris. Um, Nellie Guzman, who is starting um, her first year at NICOM this fall. Nadia Hussein. Uh, Renee Carrington. Renee is finishing her second year at UPenn, um, PhD program in biochemistry. Um, Natasha Fuguer. Natasha is finishing her second year at LIU Pharmacy School. Uh, what did I just mess up her name? Oh, Tashelle. How could I forget Tashelle? Tashelle Green finishing up her second year at UPenn as well in the pharmacology. Um, Division and Jeff Wang. Jeff Wang's finishing up his second year of dental school at um, Stony Brook. And then former, former, don't worry, this is the last slide of uh, research assistants. So we have Tanya Abel, who's a research scientist at J&J. &J. Um, you've already seen Renee. Uh, Jasmine Escalera. Uh, Jasmine is finishing her second year at Yale in um, pharmacology. Uh, Tatiana Hatchett. Tatiana is a high school chemistry teacher out in um, uh, Dade County in Miami, and Maya Filstinskaya. And of course, none of the work could be um, accomplished without financial support. So we'd like to acknowledge all of these companies. OK, and as um, Dr. Marti has pointed out this morning, um, how important it is for teaching and uh, research. You know, they are inseparable. And I just love teaching. And some of my students are here and are like, does she really love teaching? I'm yelling a lot of times. But I really do enjoy teaching. And um, I love the interaction with the students. Um, and I always tell my students that um, after the second semester of organic chemistry is done, if they don't remember anything else, they don't remember the Wolf Kishner, they don't remember the Grignard, they don't remember the Claisen condensation, there's one thing that they have to take away with them as young adults, very important thing. And that is to always use protection. <laughs> And of course, I don't know what you're thinking about, but I'm referring to eye protection, as my baby does. Her name is Baby. I'd also like to point out our organic chemistry textbook. Um, uh, it's a textbook written by myself and Bob Engel and Dave Baker at Queens College. And I'd like to thank all of you for trying to stay awake. Thank you. Okay, so very good question. So you're referring to specifically maybe erythromycin, uh, phosphonomycin, right? Our materials, the way that our materials are actually killing bacteria is that that long lipophilic chain, you know, that alkyl chain, that C16 or C12 chain, that is what is entering through the cell membrane. Okay, so that long hydrophobic chain is entering through this, is sneaking through the cell membrane. Then it drags in with it that quaternary ammonium site. That ammonium site is what is really um, destroying the cell. So it's not like it's giving uh, the cell an opportunity to mutate. It's just destroying this cell. It's like taking, um, you know, I don't want to be too graphic, but you know, taking a knife and just destroying the whole cell itself. There's no chance for it to mutate unless the whole, unless the entire cell mutates its entire cell membrane. Yes, absolutely. It's a detergent-like defect. Yes? Uh, in the synthesis part, the carbohydrate moiety you have like, posulated and then you treated with the alcohol. Mm -hmm. Have you ever considered for a time starting out with a propionate of alcohol and treating that with the alcohol may get the good reaction to going in one step instead of the posulated? No, we've not tried that. But you so, can probably recoplane the alcohol, mm -hmm. the alcohol and the alcohol can just do it no quick to look at that. That's something good to try. Um, students take note of that. Very good. Thank you, Sasan. Any other questions? 
Yes. Yes. Oh yes, yes. The most difficult um, to kill, like I mentioned, was the pseudomonas. But E. coli, no problem. And all the other gram negatives that were shown. Yes. Now, I must mention, uh, one last thing, don't kick me off yet, that um, um, you have to wash these modified surfaces under mild conditions, meaning that if you take it with Tide or, or Downy, it's going to perform a Hoffman degradation, just cleave this right off. It's going to cleave our agent right off. So you have to wash under mild conditions. One would be like a mild ivory soap. Okay, we are um, currently trying to develop our own green detergent that would be compatible uh, with our technology and also uh, green, which is good for the environment. Yes? Does the uh, material degrade with a higher level of exposure to microbes? In other words, is it lost as it used, as it used up? No, well, that's, that's a beautiful thing about it because the antimicrobial agent is bound on. So if you don't cleave it using, if you treat it with um, bleach, it's a terrible obstacle for us. It's another thing I should mention. You treat it with bleach, it's going to cleave it right off. So that's why we're having difficulties uh, getting our technology used in the hospital uh, sector because, you know, they bleach everything. Your material, your hospital linens might be completely bacteria free, but it's stained. You know, so hospitals don't want to use um, antimicrobial free uh, linens, white sheets that have stains on it. So we're, we're trying to um, work on this. But no, it does not degrade over time, as long as you don't cleave it off. I'm interested yes. in the potassium uh, uh, channels that work. You didn't mention anything beyond that. No, there's a lot to say. Um, I can send you the patent and the paper, if you like. Great. Any other questions? OK, thank you again.